start start recording and let me welcome our recording uh, visitors or our recording uh, students. Uh, I'm Paul McLeod, the uh, Minister of Education here at uh, Mount Calvary Baptist Church and thank you for joining us. We are so we have started uh, already and we were just having some discussions, a little icebreaker and talking about discipline. Well, here we are at session 17, the kingdom's fall in the series called uh, The Story. And the reason I brought up discipline is that basically Israel or, or better term Judah, the Southern kingdom of Israel is getting disciplined. And so, I thought that would be a good way to start out uh, our session today, and we'll see how this uh, see how this works out. Now, one of the things as I was preparing uh, for this session for this Bible study is something really stood out to me as I was going through, and I was trying to get in the mindset of someone who may not know the story uh, uh, that well and, and may not have read a lot of the Bible, especially around um, some things around some of the, the prophets, the major prophets, the minor prophets, may not be uh, exactly conversant with visions and prophecy and some of the apocalyptic, um, some of the apocalyptic literature. And what I came upon was, was interesting in my thought on page 235 of the story, uh, the, the thicker book, uh, something jumped out at me. Uh, as I was getting to this uh, into this mindset, and it hit me that uh, I think it's in the second full paragraph. I started reading it with fresh eyes, and I said, "What is what in the world is this? I mean, this is some some strange language. This is some some strange stuff, and we're being exposed to something uh, quite different." And so uh, let, me, let me read to you a couple of paragraphs to, uh, to just remind you of what this says. And I'm sure that you read it this past week. But on page 235, it reads, I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing uh, lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. And in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. In appearance, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Wow, what in the world are we looking at? And it goes on to say, spread out above the heads of the living creatures was what looked something like a vault, sparkling like crystal and awesome. Under the vault, their wings were stretched out one toward the other, and each had two wings covering its body. When the creatures moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the roar of roaring of rushing waters, like the voice of the Almighty, like the tumult, uh, tumult of an army. When they stood still, they lowered their wings. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. Above the vault, over their heads, was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the, uh, the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal, as if full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire. And brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. And as I looked, I've read that before, but as I was reading it with what I call new eyes, imagining that I'm reading it for the first time, I had to sit and think for a minute, what in the world are we looking at? What, I mean, what, are we, what is Ezekiel looking, uh, looking at in this particular, in this particular, um, in this particular vision? And so one of the, my objectives in this Bible study is to help you understand what that vision 
uh, was and how it kind of fit into this um, whole narrative of Israel or of, of Judah getting taken to, to Babylon. The second thing that, that I want to focus on in this Bible study session is to understand that God does not abandon his people in the upper story. There's a lot going on in the lower story here. We, we've got kings, mostly bad kings, acting up, people acting up, uh, a nation being raised by God uh, and coming and going against uh, the southern kingdom of Israel and basically taking over the country. Uh, Jerusalem is razed. The temple is burned. Uh, the people get deported. Uh, there's a lot of names. But how does this all fit into God's redemptive plan? And so that's one of the things that we're going to be taking a look at also. Now, going back to this uh, vision that Ezekiel had, I, what I want to do is I want to play a couple of videos. Uh, these are videos from the Bible Project. Many of you are, uh, are aware of these. You can find them on YouTube. The first one is Ezekiel chapters 1 through 33. It's about seven and a half minutes long. The second one is the rest of Ezekiel. It's chapters 34 through 38, and it's a little over seven minutes long. So for about the next 15 minutes, really what I would like to do is to give you an idea of what's going on with this vision and what was going on in the book of Ezekiel. The reason I wanted to give you a, a really good view of the book of Ezekiel, uh, there's a couple of different reasons. Number one, it really tells the story of what's going on with Israel, why they got taken into captivity, into, into exile, what was going on in the upper story. And it gives you a good view of what was going on with Ezekiel's vision. And it explains very, very well, I think the video explains very well, of how it fits into uh, the, the redemptive plan of God. Now, this particular vision, some scholars classify it as apocalyptic literature. Uh, some do. Most scholars, however, do not classify it as apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature basically being the type of literature that you might see uh, in the latter half of the book of Daniel, or in the book of the Revelation uh, by John. Very symbolic, weird creatures flying around. Sometimes there's a uh, uh, fiery hell that's coming down. Uh, people that with, uh, or creatures with uh, several faces and wings with eyes on it, a lot of symbolism. Um, this particular vision, I think is, is, is kind of like apocalyptic literature. Uh, however, most scholars don't think uh, think it's so. But we'll get into when we start getting into Daniel uh, next week. Then I'll talk more about apocalyptic literature. But for right now, just focus on Ezekiel's vision and how does it uh, give us or how does it highlight God's redemptive plan and what it really means. So bear with me for a minute. I am going to uh, share my screen, and you may. You may have to adjust your volume on your device depending on uh, your device. So here we go. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was a priest who had been living in Jerusalem during the first Babylonian attack on the city. And they spared the city, but they took a first wave of Israelite prisoners and hauled them off into exile, and Ezekiel was among them. So the book begins five years after all that, and Ezekiel is sitting on the bank of an irrigation canal near his Israelite refugee camp, and it's his 30th birthday, no less, the year that he would have been installed as a priest in Jerusalem. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel has this vision. He sees a storm cloud approaching, and then inside the cloud are four strange creatures that have wings outstretched and touching each other. And these creatures each had four faces. And then he saw four wheels, one by 
each creature. And then he saw that the wings of the creatures were supporting this dazzling platform. And then on that platform is a throne. And then sitting on that throne is this human-like creature glowing and shrouded in fire. And then all of a sudden Ezekiel realizes what he's seeing. He calls it the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. It's God riding his royal throne chariot. Now the word glory, in Hebrew it's kavod, it means heavy or significant. The biblical authors use this word to describe the physical appearance and manifestation of God's significance when he shows up in person. These images in the vision, they're very similar to what happened when God appeared on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. And it's also very similar to the depictions of God's presence over the Ark of the Covenant. And that's actually the most shocking thing about Ezekiel's vision. What is God's glory doing in Babylon? It's supposed to be above the Ark of the Covenant in the temple in Jerusalem. And so the first section of the book opens to explore that question as Ezekiel begins to accuse Israel of rebellion. So God first speaks to Ezekiel from the throne chariot and he commissions him as a prophet. Ezekiel is to accuse Israel of breaking their covenant agreement with God in a couple ways. Israel has given their allegiance to other gods and has been worshiping idols and this has all led to rampant social injustice and violence. And so as a result, God appoints Ezekiel to warn the people. The first Babylonian attack that took Ezekiel into exile is going to be matched by another. And Jerusalem, its temple, all face imminent destruction. So Ezekiel uses words and more to get his message across. He also performs sign acts. And these were a form of street theater. Ezekiel would go out in public and start behaving in these really bizarre ways that were like parables of his prophetic message. So he was supposed to build a tiny model of Jerusalem and then stage an attack on it. Or he was to shave off all of his hair and then chop it up with a sword. Or the most extreme, he was to play the role of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. And he would lay on his side for over a year eating food cooked over poop as a sign of the nasty food that people will have to eat during the siege of Jerusalem. And perhaps the most disheartening thing of all is the bad news God gave Ezekiel that no one was going to listen to him. Israel would reject him because of their rebellious and hard heart. And this recalls Moses' description of the people after the wilderness rebellions, when he predicted that exile would one day happen, and Ezekiel had the unfortunate privilege of seeing it all come to pass. And so a dismayed Ezekiel, he begins to perform his task. And after about a year, he has another vision. This one is about the temple. He goes on this virtual tour of the temple and he sees what's happening there in his absence and it is not good. In the outer courtyard in front of the temple, he sees this large idol statue. And then he sees the elders of Israel worshiping other gods, both outside and inside the temple. And then he sees the women of Israel. They're worshiping a Babylonian god named Tammuz. And the vision ends with God's glorious throne chariot moving up and away from the temple. It's leaving, going east, headed towards Babylon. And so in chapter 11, we come to see why and how God's glory appeared to Ezekiel there in Babylon. Israel's idolatry and their covenant violations, it's become so blatant and offensive that God has left his temple. They've driven him away and he consigns it to destruction. But God hasn't abandoned his people. Rather, he goes into exile with them. And so at the end of this vision in chapter 11, God promises that he will return a remnant of Israel back to the land and he'll transform them by removing their heart of stone and giving them a new soft heart of flesh so that they can love and truly follow their God after all. This is a small glimmer of hope and it's quickly submerged under the reality of the imminent destruction. But chapter 11, it's a key transition and it helps us understand how the rest of the book has been designed. So the next three sections are all announcements of God's judgment, first on Israel, then on the nations around Israel, and then on Jerusalem itself. But then after that, the hopeful conclusion of chapter 11 gets developed in the final three sections of the book. First hope for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all creation. Chapters 12 through 24 focus on God's judgment coming to Israel. And this is a diverse collection of poems and essays. And here Ezekiel shows his fondness for parable and allegory. So he depicts Israel as a burnt, useless stick 
or as a rebellious wife, or as a dangerous raging lion that gets captured, or as two promiscuous sisters. These are all depictions of Israel's senseless rebellion and idolatry that results in their ruin. In this section, Ezekiel also acts like a lawyer. He begins arguing the case that, first of all, Jerusalem's destruction is truly deserved after centuries of covenant violation, and that even if the most righteous people in the world, like Noah or Daniel or Job, were alive and praying for God to spare Israel, God would not accept their prayers. It's far too late. And so God's goodness actually demands that he bring justice on this generation of Israel. The exile has become inevitable. They've reached the point of no return. Following this, Ezekiel focuses first on the nations immediately around Israel, and then on the two most powerful states in the region, Egypt and then Tyre. Israel has allied with these nations and adopted their gods and their idols, and so God accuses the kings of Tyre and Egypt for arrogantly viewing themselves as gods who get to define right and wrong on their own terms. And God holds these kings accountable for their pride, and he announces that he will use Babylon to bring them down. They will face God's justice along with everybody else. Following these really intense sections is a short story in chapter 33. Ezekiel's met by a refugee who's just arrived from Jerusalem, and he gives them the report that Babylon has attacked the city of Jerusalem, that the city has fallen, and the temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim warnings have become a reality. But remember, the end of chapter 11, that's not the end of the story. And so in the next video, we'll explore Ezekiel's profound vision of hope. But for now, that's the first half of the book of Ezekiel. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. In the first video, we were introduced to Ezekiel the priest, and he's sitting among the exiles in Babylon, and he's confronted by the awesome glory of God's temple presence. The book of the prophet Ezekiel. In the first video, we were introduced to Ezekiel the priest, and he's sitting among the exiles in Babylon, and he's confronted by the awesome glory of God's temple presence, but it's appearing to him in Babylon. And then Ezekiel discovers why. It's because of Israel's idolatry and injustice that has compelled God to abandon his own temple. And while there is still hope for the future, the book went on to develop Ezekiel's message of divine judgment, first for Israel and then for the nations around Israel. And then a key moment happened in chapter 33. Ezekiel receives a report that the Babylonian siege of Jerusalem is over because the city has fallen. The temple is destroyed. Ezekiel's grim words of warning came true. The exile was the most horrendous catastrophe that ever happened to Israel, and it raised the big questions of whether God was done with Israel for good. But remember, at the end of chapter 11, God promised that there was still a future beyond exile for Israel. And so the rest of the book is designed to explore Ezekiel's vision of hope, first for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all of creation. The hope for Israel begins with God promising to raise up a new David, a future messianic king who's going to be the kind of leader that Israel needed but never got. And this new Israel who's going to come under the messianic king's rule is going to be a transformed people. God's going to deal with the heart of their problem of rebellion by giving them new hearts. It's just like Moses promised at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. God says he's going to remove their hard hearts and send his spirit into his people to give them new soft hearts that can love and obey their God. And this idea gets developed in the next strange vision. Ezekiel sees a huge valley filled up with dry human bones and skeletons, and God tells him that it's an image, a metaphor, for Israel's spirit state. So their rebellion against God, it resulted in exile and the literal death of many people, but it was also a metaphorical death of their covenant relationship. And God tells Ezekiel that his spirit is coming to bring his people back to life. And so this wind comes and it causes all of the bones to stand up and it fills them with breath and life and then skin grows over the bones and then all of a sudden Ezekiel sees all of these new humans standing in front of him. Now this vision, it's recalling the story about the creation of humans in Genesis chapter 2, where God made humans out of dirt and divine breath. 
And so Israel and all humanity have rebelled, resulting in death. And so the only hope is that God would perform a new act of creation and remake humans in such a way that they can truly live in a relationship of love with God and with each other. And so after God is going to deal with the evil that's in the hearts of his own people, some questions still remain unresolved. Like, what about the evil that's still rampant out there among the nations? And what about the future of God's dwelling place in the temple? And this is what the final two sections of the book are about. So first come chapters 38 and 39, and they promise God's final defeat of evil among the nations, which gets personified by a ruler who's named Gog from the land of Magog. Now this name is derived from a genealogy of ancient kingdoms and lands from Genesis chapter 10, and it referred to powerful nations from the distant past. And so Ezekiel picks up this ancient biblical name as an image of any and all violent kingdoms. And so we find that Gog gets allied with seven nations that come from all four directions of the compass is clearly an image that represents all of the nations. And this also helps us understand why Ezekiel describes Gog with images that he used earlier in the book to describe the king of Tyre and the king of Egypt, Pharaoh. For Ezekiel, Gog is an amalgam of all of the worst, most violent people in the Bible. Gog is the archetype of human rebellion against God. The basic story in these chapters is that Gog resists God's plan to restore his people. And so just like Pharaoh in the Exodus story, Gog comes to destroy the people. But God unleashes his justice on Gog, and it's in a flurry of scenes that don't actually make very good literal sense if you read them in sequence. Because first Gog and his armies are consumed by an earthquake, but then they're consumed by fire two different times, and then after that God comes and strikes Gog and his army down in the fields where they lay unburied for months. It's clear that these scenes are full of symbol and imagery. Ezekiel has pulled out his entire poetic tool set here to describe how God is determined to finally defeat human evil that has ruined his world. And it's so that he can pave the way for a new creation. And so once evil is finally dealt with among the nations, the last section of the book describes how God's presence is going to one day return to his people and his temple to bring cosmic restoration. So Ezekiel first gets this long elaborate vision of a new temple and a new city. He's given this heavenly tour guide who shows him around the new temple complex and it's much larger and more majestic than even Solomon's temple. There's a new altar, new priests, a whole new system of worship. And then after this elaborate tour, God's glorious throne chariot that he saw back in his first vision comes back and it enters the new temple. Now the meaning of these temple visions has been the source of debate for a long, long time. So some Christian and Jewish readers believe that this vision will be fulfilled literally one day and that these chapters offer the actual blueprints of the new temple that will be built when the Messiah returns and brings God's kingdom. But many other Jewish and Christian readers think that this vision, like all of Ezekiel's other visions, is full of symbols. And they depict the reality of God's presence returning to his people in the Messianic kingdom, but not necessarily in the form of an actual building. Whichever view you take, it's important that Ezekiel never calls the city Jerusalem. And chapters 47 and 48 show why. Ezekiel sees this tiny stream pouring out of the temple threshold and steps, and then it quickly becomes this raging river, and then it flows out of the temple and the city into the desert, into one of the most desolate places on planet Earth, the Dead Sea Valley. And then that river, it leaves behind it a trail of trees and life, and then the Dead Sea gets transformed into a living sea that's teeming with plants and animals. All of this imagery comes from the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And we see just how cosmic Ezekiel's vision really is. God's plan has always been to restore all humanity and all creation back to his life-giving presence. And so the book ends with the name of this garden city. The Lord is there. And so Ezekiel's visions come to a close, full of hope for a new future. New humans living in a new world that's animated by God's life-giving spirit. It's a world permeated with God's love and justice. And that's what the book of Ezekiel is all about. All right. Well, that is an overview in uh, contained within two videos of all the of all of Ezekiel, a good uh, overview. I've asked you to, if you look at your screen, to unmute. 
My question to you is going back to this vision, the initial vision that Ezekiel had, what is the significance and what is the function of this, uh, of this weird vision that we read in our chapter, in chapter 17? What was that and, and, and what significance did it have in the book of Ezekiel? I don't know, but I guess if it's a the accusations against Israel at this time, or not Israel, uh, Judah, uh, about the breaking of the covenant. All right, that's part of, uh, yes, that's part of the uh, book of Ezekiel. Yeah, the accusations, definitely, definitely. What was, uh, what was that, uh, that weird vision that Ezekiel had, what was, what was that? What did that symbolize? I thought it symbolized the Ark of the Covenant and God, so. Okay, the Ark of the Covenant and God. I saw some similarities there uh, with uh, <clears throat> some of the radiance, some of the glory, and, um, but I think you, I think you hit it near the end of your statement, Faye, in saying it was God. Um, near the end of the vision in the scripture, it right. says, it says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when he saw it, he fell face down, and I heard the voice of one speaking. So based on that description, I would say that was basically the appearance of the Lord. I mean, there was glory, there was worship. I mean, there was only one person, one entity, let me say that, that accepts worship uh, like that, and that is and that is God. And so all that glory, so that was really the presence of the Lord symbolized in that, in that vision. Did you catch uh, the surprise that we should have had that that vision, the presence of God was there in Babylon? What in the world was God doing in Babylon? Why, why was God in Babylon? God was in Babylon. I'm sorry, say that again. He was trying to get their attention in Babylon. So that's where most of the, the captives went to Babylon. And that's where his people were at the time. And in order to get his message to them, he had to go to them. And he tried to dissuade them from uh, worshiping foreign idols and falling into the ways of the Babylonians. Okay. And Carrie, you were about to say? Oh, that's a, he said the same thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. I said that was a wonderful birthday surprise he got. <laughs> <laughs> You picked up on that. It actually was yeah. his birthday when he was sitting by the river <laughs> and had the and had the vision. That was good that you you picked up on that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was actually his presence in Babylon. Now you have to remember that Babylon was considered a very evil place at that mm -hmm. time. I mean, as, as bad as Israel was, I mean, they, they bowed down to gods. I mean, near the end there, they were actually sacrificing their children to Moloch. Uh, they were doing worse things. If you read carefully, uh, it says that Israel was doing, I'm sorry, Judah was doing worse things than the heathen nations around them. So they got really good at it. And, mm -hmm. and they were doing worse things. But Babylon was the center, was the symbolical center of pagan idolatry during that time. And there God's presence was. More surprising was, uh, did you catch the fact that God's presence left? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure did. Notice that. Mm -hmm. Yep. He's like, he's like, hey, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what do you think he came to rescue them as well maybe or just to show them his power or ah good question 
Very good, very good question. Uh, all the people probably thought that God was going to rescue them. I mean, number one, they could not believe that Jerusalem was taken over. I mean, God's people. I mean, we're, we're you know, imagine yourself being a, a, a Judite uh, at, during that time or a Benjamite at that time. We're God's chosen people. We can just, and they basically had the idea that, hey, we can basically do whatever we want. God is on our side. The problem was they weren't on God's side. And, right. and, and, and that, was the, that was the problem. Uh, so they were very surprised that Jerusalem was taken over, that the temple was burned, that they were taken to Babylon. And I could imagine a lot of people thinking, well, gosh, Ezekiel had this great vision and we've got God's presence and uh, things are going to turn around and we're going to be rescued in no time at all. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of time passed, and we'll talk about this next week in the next couple of weeks, how long it took for them to get delivered and what it took for them to get delivered and to go back to Jerusalem. So many of them probably thought that, yes, they were about to be delivered, that they were about to get rescued, uh, but that wasn't the case. That was not the case. In fact, one prophet told them, hey, look, settle down. Uh, uh, you know, build houses, right? Settle, settle down and and just get used to it because you're going to be here for a, for a while. We'll we'll go over that in the next couple of of weeks. To get more into this, let's turn to Randy Frazee, and he's going to develop uh, this theme of the upper story a little more for us and to help us uh, to get a perspective of what was going on in the in the upper story. Uh, you can find the notes that you can take. Uh, you can go ahead and turn in your study in your study guide uh, to page, and I've got my notes here, to page 149. At the bottom of page 149, there's some fill in the blanks there that you can, if you listen carefully, you can fill in those, uh, you can fill in those blanks. So I'm going to go ahead and queue up Randy Frazee, and we'll have a short discussion after, after he is finished. This is your story, this is my story, but most of all, this is the greatest story ever told. This is God's story. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab king of Israel had done. He bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshiped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. The two courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced divination, sought omens, and consulted mediums and spirits. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets. 
until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. Those may be some of the most difficult words to hear. There is no remedy. You have battled with cancer, and the doctor is finally obligated to say those words to you. There is no remedy. You are going to die. You have battled through a difficult marriage, and finally your spouse says to you, there is no remedy. It's time for a divorce. You have struggled to make your business work, but finally the bank says those painful words, there is no remedy. It's time to shut it down. This is where God is at with Israel, and he is finally forced to say it. There is no remedy. Now, how did Israel get here? Well, we have learned through our journey in the story that God established the nation of Israel from scratch as his plan to reveal himself and to provide a way to get all people back. To do this, he gave Israel the law, which instructs Israel on how life with God works, how to love God and how to love each other. People would see how life in community with God works and be drawn to God as the one true God who loves them as well. But Israel didn't keep up to their end of the bargain. For hundreds of years, God patiently waited and warned them. He gave them second chances and even third chances, but they would not listen. God would be justified in scrapping the whole plan and starting over with a new group of people. But he made an unconditional promise to Abraham that the Messiah, the one who would provide the way back to God, would come from Israel. Specifically, the Messiah would come from David's family, the tribe of Judah. So we have seen over the last few chapters that God whittles Israel down to a small remnant, the once big, unstoppable, unified nation of Israel is divided in two, north and south. The northern kingdom of Israel, made up of 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, is captured by a pagan nation called the Assyrians and deported and assimilated into their pagan culture in 722 BC. Only the southern kingdom of Judah remains. While Judah did have five good kings over a 350-year period, they were as evil as the northern kings. Now here's a good example at the opening of chapter 17. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. Now I really believe in giving young people opportunities to lead, but I think becoming a king when you're in junior high may be a bit much. I think there should be a rule that you can't become king until you're done with acne. It certainly proves to be the case for Manasseh. He didn't just do evil in the eyes of the Lord. The story tells us he did much evil, shed so much innocent blood, did more evil than the Amorites. The Amorites, these are the people who were so evil that God stripped the land of Canaan from them and gave it to the Israelites. God would be totally just in starting over if it weren't for the promise. But it wasn't just Manasseh. Of the remaining six kings in Judah, only one, Josiah, is good. But he challenges my theory. He was only eight years old when he took the throne. Like in the northern kingdom, God raised up prophets to give the kings and the people his messages. It was time for Judah to hear God's plan in light of their persistent evil. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. If God continues to bless Judah, while they're living so inconsistent with God's word and life, it will send a confusing message about who God is and how life in community with God works. God must discipline them. 
he does so with a distinct purpose in mind. The prophet Ezekiel gives Judah this message. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through you before their eyes. What does God do? He raises up another pagan nation, the Babylonians, who will do to Judah what Assyria did to Israel. Over a period of 20 years, they will capture them, burn down the city, destroy the beautiful temple that Solomon built, and deport the people to Babylon. This begins in 605 BC and is complete in 586 BC. You know, these last couple of chapters haven't exactly been the kind of pick-you-up messages you need to inspire you, have they? But they are true, and we need to give you the whole Word of God, not just the nice parts. Remember this, grace isn't all that fantastic if you don't know you need it. And boy, do we need it. But there is a, a bright spot, something inspirational in this message that I think we can all take with us into the world to encourage us. It has to do with the prophet Jeremiah. Listen to his story. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God tells Jeremiah that before he was even born, he had an idea of what part Jeremiah would play in the unfolding of God's upper story. That's awesome. But the same is true for us today. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 of the New Testament reads, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God is saying the same thing to everyone hearing these words who professes Jesus the Messiah, their Savior. This is not just for Jeremiah, but for everyone who belongs to Christ. He already has things in mind for you if you will align your life to the upper story of God. Now that's overwhelming. Jeremiah felt the same way. He said, I, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. You and I feel the same way, don't we? I'm too young, I'm too old, I'm not smart enough, can't talk in front of people, not dis disciplined enough to be counted on, and we go on and on. The story tells us that God reaches down and touches Jeremiah's mouth and tells him that he will be with him every step of the way. The same is true for New Testament believers. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that when Jesus returned to the Father, the Holy Spirit came down and touched us, gifted us, equipped us with everything we need to accomplish the assignment God has for us. What was Jeremiah's assignment? He was assigned the task of the weeping prophet. God told him that he would give out God's message, but the people would not listen. He's essentially telling him that he's going to fail in the world's eyes. God tells Jeremiah that Judah needs to know that the devastation they are going to experience soon is not really from the Babylonians, but discipline from God's hands. There is a principle in this for us. In God's employment contract, he doesn't ask us to be successful by the world standards, but faithful. Success is faithfulness to God, not results. God told Jeremiah to stay behind in Jerusalem after Judah was exiled to see the ruins and write down what he saw. Jeremiah is standing in a pile of rubble and the people are walking in single file to the east to Babylon, smoldering embers from the fire, the temple that Solomon built for the Lord destroyed and he weeps bitterly and writes a book in the Old Testament called Lamentations, which means to weep. But there's a bright spot. Amidst all the tough love and discipline, God tells Jeremiah to tell Judah that he's going to bring them back home. Maybe you've heard these words before and didn't know it came from the lips of Jeremiah to the now exiled nation of Judah. Yet this I call to mind and therefore have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. 
With God's people, there is never a strong, truthful bout of loving discipline without God's grace following right behind it. It was true for Judah, it's true for us. Great is thy faithfulness. That should sound familiar, the song and also our scripture for, uh, for this month in our Sunday worship services. We have time to discuss, and, and I was thinking, what one question could we address that pretty much wraps up this chapter? And it, uh, and it came to me to ask this question, and I'll go ahead and ask you to, uh, uh, to come off of mute. How does this chapter both warn us and give us hope? How does this, this chapter that we've just finished both warn us today and give us hope? What are your thoughts? When you have a faithful relationship with God, then you are destined for success. And success is not measured by the, by the worldly, you know, um, uh, standards. You know, success with faithfulness with God means he will always be there and never leave you or forsake you. You know, your, your, your needs will be met. You know, you will um, you will continue through your life, and he will always be there to make sure that you get what 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 you're supposed to have. You will be blessed if you don't have done in your life. If you have, if you're not, if you don't, if you forsake him, then you are destined to have an ex exiled. Um, life, which leads to destruction. Hmm. Okay. Thank you, Denise. That's a that's a, that's a contrast there. Yeah. Okay. I saw a couple other people uh, wanting to say something. If we always put our best foot forward and obey the laws of the Lord, he is always going to be there for us. We may be disciplined, but discipline is a part of growth. And so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Randy Frazee put it, and I, and I wrote this down here, he put it in, the, in terms of align yourself to the upper story. Mm -hmm. I kind of like that, that phrase of, of alignment. I like the, so the, what he said, success is faithfulness to God. Mm -hmm. I like that. Because if you be faithful to him, you will be successful. You may not be a perfect person, and that's what he doesn't look at. You know, we think that we have to be perfect, but he just perfect. wants you to be faithful to him. Faithful. Exactly. Isn't and this you, a change of perspective? Go ahead, go ahead, Carrie. Oh, I, that's all right. I'm just going to say, and we can see in the story all along the whole way that no matter what they did, he, those were his chosen people, he never gave up. He stood, but, you know, even he left one temple and went to another one just to fall and, you know, to be with us or with the people that his people that he had chosen. So that let us know that no matter how we struggle, and sometimes we think that we're struggling, not doing what we're supposed to do, but that lets us know that, you know, as long as we, it's not about what we do here, it's what we do for God, what he wants us to do. Exactly. Oh. Uh, you ever see the signs they have on these buildings when they restored them that says, uh, 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 please excuse this mess, we're under uh, construction. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's kind of what they were involved in. It was going to be messy. It was going to be shaky. But when God got through with it, it's going to be all right. 
Use this mess under yeah. construction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like some that. of us, some of us are a little messier than others, but yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, it. that's pretty good. Yeah, I, I think I like the uh yeah, it, if if I had to those bullets at the uh at the bottom of page 149, if I had to pick one of those that really stood out. Uh, I'd have to say that last one that uh, that uh, some I think uh, Carrie I think that you brought out that success is faithfulness to God not results, and it reminds me of some advice or something that Reverend Franklin said when I when I got here a little over six years ago. I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing this story, but um, we were talking about ministry. We were talking about um, different things and and. Um, Somewhere in the conversation, he said, God did not call us to be a success. What he did was he called us to be faithful. And at that time, I kind of knew that, but I didn't know it. And I'm kind of task oriented. I'm kind of process oriented. Um, you know, I like things to be organized. and I like to get results and all that great stuff. <laughs> and, and part of me wanted to argue them down. <laughs> part of me wanted to say, no, 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 we got to, you know, uh, we need to be successful and get results and, you know, and, uh, and be driven and all this other kind of stuff. But I had enough wisdom to, to be quick to listen and slow to speak. <laughs> mm -hmm. And as I meditated on that, and I actually did some studying in, in the word on it, 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 it hit me and, and I was all in on it. I kind of knew it, but it didn't really hit me until that conversation with Reverend Franklin. So I, I, I think, I think that bullet point is, is, is really, is really great. What well, wasn't it? Wasn't it Jeremiah that he told him, uh, he sent him and he had a message to give, but he told him that nobody was going to listen to him anyway. They were going to listen. I mean, can you imagine if he told you that? And you be thinking, well, I'm not even going to go out there and bother with it. I might have turned and ran like Jonah did. <laughs> but it was, you know, that was the point to, Jonah, get, to get the results. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there are a lot of people in ministry, and um, we all are in ministry, by the way. Uh, you don't have to be full time at a church. You don't mm -hmm. even have to uh, be part time or have an official title before or after your name. We're all in ministry, but the ministry mindset is faithfulness to God, uh, not numbers. Uh, you know, you could, you could have a church service where you're the only one there, uh, and you're faithful to the message that God had you prepare and to deliver, and that's called success. Mm -hmm. not, it, it, the fact that you didn't draw a crowd or there wasn't important people there to hear you or a lot of people has nothing to do with success. What if God put you on this earth of all the things that you've done in, in your whole life, uh, maybe even volunteered, stepped into a ministry uh, where God wants you to be either in leadership or volunteering or whatever. And out of all those things, what if God, what if you found out later on the eternal side of life, that God brought you to this earth to bless one person. Mm -hmm. yep. Out of all the people you've talked to and prayed for and maybe mm -hmm. contributed financially to and have helped, uh, what if it was just for that one person? Mm -hmm. That's a ministry mindset that, mm -hmm. that we have to have. You know, Paul, that's just like when we're in our discipleship training, you know, you think that you're supposed to bring somebody to Christ, but that's not what he asked you to do. He just asked you to put the word, plant the seed. And if you plant the seed, then God is going to water the seed and make it grow. It's not, you know, you don't have to hammer somebody to death trying to make them turn to Christ. Just put the word out there, tell him, you know, tell his truth. And then he waters it and he brings it to fruition. Yeah. So that, that, you know, we trying to sometimes want to get, be successful and bring somebody, but that's not what he told us to do. He just told us to go out there and spread the word. Be faithful to the message and be faithful mm -hmm. to the ministry he's called you 
called you to. Mm -hmm. And I've always felt like you too, that a lot of times we as Christians think, sometimes you're thinking that when you read it, that's going to be something grand that he's going to tell you to do. And I was I always thought like you, that it might just be one person that uh, come in. I had a lady one time to tell me uh, when I first started doing her and I was uh this uh, lady came in, she's an older white lady. She came in and, you know, she's like one of them country women. She had her daughter with her. And I, you know, just tried to talk like I always do, make people feel comfortable and just talk to her. And she was kind of down, kind of feeling down. And I just talked to her. And about a week or so later, the lady called me back at the shop and she told me who she was. And she said, I just want to thank you. She said, because my daughter was very depressed when she came in there. She said, and when she left out of there, you made her feel so good. She said, and I want to thank you. She said, because the next week she took her life. But she said that day she felt really good. And mm -hmm. she said, I want to just thank you for that. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. The impact that we make on other people's lives, sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. So we really see, and just to start wrapping this up, what we really see is in the fall of the Southern kingdom, God's people, Judah and the small uh, tribe of Je Benjamin, we see both a warning and we, we see hope. And, and I hope you see that there are two sides to this, that God is a just judge. There is wrath that has built up mm -hmm. and must be poured out onto his people for, for God to be the just judge and for him to be holy, but there's, it's always with hope of the restoration. And, and we get a glimpse of that restoration in the book of Ezekiel with the new creation. And that's what we're looking forward to. And that's what we're building the kingdom of God and bringing other people uh, to experience that new kingdom. So yes, with the wrath, with the warning, there is hope. And that hope is in the restoration in our relationship uh, with God. In the Old Testament, it was through the law and through being the chosen people of Israel. In the New Testament, in this new covenant time, is through grace and through the finished work of Jesus Christ that we have that restoration, that we have that, that we have that hope. And so the Old Testament reflects that covenant that we that we now have in that, yes, God is still uh, judging. He's still pouring out wrath. He's still disciplining, but it's always in restoration and that hope of restoration that we would repent and that we would humble ourselves before him and align ourselves with that upper, with that upper story. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing the two sides of it and we'll continue to see that throughout the rest of the, of the story. For next week, let's take a look at Daniel in exile. And so you'll be looking at pages 152 to 156 in your study guide, 152 to 156. Now that they're in the exile, we're going to have a couple of weeks to look at what did life look like in the exile. Okay, they're there. They've cried. Uh, some of them don't have any tears left. Uh, they're starting to settle down in Babylon. How does mm -hmm. that life look like? And the big question in their mind was, it, how do you worship God in a pagan city, in a corrupt, vile, uh, pagan city like Babylon? How do you worship the true God? How do, we, how do we do this? Is he even with us? Is he still for us? Is he still going to, um, uh, you know, bless us? And, and are we still children of promise? And has he forgotten about us? So all those questions that they're going through for the next couple of weeks, we're going to take a look at life in exile. So I'm excited to take a, take a look at it. Any last minute questions or, or comments uh, before I say goodbye to our recording uh, students? A wonderful discussion. Thank you for bringing out your uh, observations and what you've caught in this uh, in this lesson and bringing out the main points. 
and um, and looking at those videos. For our recording students, thank you for hanging in there with us. If uh, these have really blessed you, I'd ask you to, to hit the thumbs up button and like us, tell others about this. And if you would like to join us live uh, for this Bible study, call our office uh, here at Mount Calvary Baptist Church, 524-5912. 524-5912, area code is 865, you're in Tennessee, and uh, we'll get you hooked up. So goodbye to our recording students, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.